Some of you may be thinking, hang on a minute, I recognise you, you're Dan Brown. That idiot who bought a boat, made hundreds of boat life videos, then sold his boat, said he was never coming back, made videos and wrote a book about that, and then within two years had another boat. Well, you're completely right. All I can say is that I couldn't resist the call of the canal. What you're seeing on screen now is the view from the front of my new boat, Abel's Ark. This video was recorded about six years after I first bought Narrowboat Tilly, and roughly two years after I sold Narrowboat Tilly and left Narrowboat life forever. As you can probably tell at this point, that didn't go quite the way I'd intended it to. However, before we talk about my adventure into land life, Let's have a look at Narrowboat Tilly and give ourselves some context to my relationship and ongoing love affair with the canals. When I bought Narrowboat Tilly I was 25, I was filled with the excitement of getting my first boat and I was certainly willing to overlook an awful lot of home comforts and mini luxuries to get out and about onto the canals. I'd originally intended to buy a bigger boat than I ended up with. Tilly was very, very small, but my impatience, I suppose, to get out onto the canal really got the better of me. And so for £11,000, I bought Tilly 30 feet long. Only 15 feet of that was indoor space, which you then had to take the bathroom area out, which had a sink, the boiler. It was a wet room, shower room, and also had a cassette style portable toilet in there, which was the height of luxury as you can imagine. Then the rest of the boats had to obviously be my living room and bedroom all in one area through the use of a sofa bed. It had my kitchen with a sink and a bit of storage and a two hob oven and grill. And then I had a little writing desk where I wrote all of my little short books about boat life and had a little bit more storage. And for four years, that was my home. The years that I spent on board Narrowboat Tilly were really some of the best times of my life. And there's almost an element of worry when I look back at that period, because I fear that I will never be as happy in my day-to-day -day general life as I was back then. Although in the early years, as I had such little boating experience, I was terrified of everything and every scrape and knock that I gave the boat and every creak and drip sound that I heard on board overnight all worried me terribly and way more than I should have let it worry me. But it was also the fact that I was such a novice and so green to the world of boating that let me have a load of experiences for the first time so waking up and seeing the first snowfall from on board a boat and the first thunderstorm and all of that sort of stuff then you've got the elements of wildlife seeing herons across the way when you open the curtains first thing in the morning and all of those things for the first time and lots of those first experiences it was just an absolutely wonderful time of my life and adding on top of that, the fact that I was actually able to live this incredibly rural, peaceful and active outdoors life as well that I'd hoped that I'd be able to, it really did take what I'd started with my lifestyle before I had a boat, where I'd basically lived with my mum in Oswestry where I was born and raised. And although I lived with my mum, I think in the years running up to buying Tilly, you'd struggle to find many weeks, if any, that I would actually have spent maybe seven nights in a row sleeping at my mum's house because I was just all out and about all the time, whether that was cycling and walking the thousands of miles a year that I was already doing before I had a boat, or stopping at friends' houses, going camping, and just generally, just almost that strange, rootless life 
but with a proper house that I could go and live in in relative comfort and ease if I wanted to. But instead, I would end up going and spending multiple nights a week, pretty much every week, maybe sleeping on a sofa bed or on pillows off a sofa on my friend's floor rather than the big double beds that I'd bought myself, which now lives on board Narrowboat Abel's Ark. But my life before Narrowboat Tilly was already a very active and rootless life. And so, as many people would struggle maybe without a home mooring and wandering around on the canal in the way that I did with Narrowboat Tilly, to me, it wasn't that much of a departure because I'd never really, or at least for quite a while, I hadn't really said, oh, right, this is where I live, this is my fixed base, and this is where I associate my home, and I have to be here to be at peace. So obviously having something like a boat that I could take around the countryside that was my moving base, that you could have a different view out of the window every day if you wanted, it was just it was just a beautiful, beautiful time and a wonderful experience. As the years wore on, I had to finally start to face the truth that Narrowboat Tilly being so small as she was wouldn't last me forever, and I couldn't continue indefinitely to live the incredibly active lifestyle that I had been living, and that was something that took a little bit of getting my mind around as the entire premise and basis of me buying a boat was to live that active lifestyle. So as I started to look at bigger boats that were going to cost tens of thousands of pounds and contemplate maybe getting Narrowboat Tilly completely renovated from the inside out, I just started to lose my passion for the idea. And I think that had I not have gone into boat life with such a determination that the whole point of boat life wasn't to be sat on a boat, it was to be out and about in the great outdoors, then I would have probably been able to have a more open mind looking at the reality of my future and growing up and getting older, that that wasn't something that I could always do forever. It was certainly one thing to go out cycling for 20 miles plus for pleasure, but it's a completely different thing when you're putting in, say, a 10-mile bike ride to go and do an eight-hour shift at a supermarket and then getting back on your bike and having another 10 miles to get home. And that was something that I... I don't know. In hindsight, there wasn't one particular reason that led me to leave the canal lifestyle and there wasn't one particular thing that made me go, oh, this is definitely a deal-breaker. But as I was making these decisions during one of the wettest winters on record, where the country saw flooding in unprecedented levels and flooding in places that had never had floods in living memory, we went for months on end sometimes without having a truly dry day, without some rain sooner or later. And trying to keep my motivation and spirits up, as I would be cycling to work and cycling in and out of Oswestry and every time I went out I was getting soaked, I was getting covered in mud down some of the country lanes depending on where Tilly was moored up as the surfaces with the tractors going in and out of the fields in a historically wet winter were often on some of the lanes quite literally more like muddy tracks than actual tarmac surfaces and then dragging your wet clothes inside your tiny little boat after work at night, having all of that steam up the inside of the boats while they were drying off above the fire as I made my little sofa bed up and huddled around. It was not the most positive of experience and it probably affected my clarity of thought in looking at other boats to a greater extent than I should have let it. But ultimately, I finally made the decision that it was time to move back to dry land. 
Hello there folks, I'm Dan Brown from Sort of Interesting. Well, people have been asking for the grand tour of the new place, so let's get stuck straight in. On June the 5th, 2016, I handed over the keys to Narrowboat Tilly's new owner. And within a month, I was taking my own new set of keys to the flat that I moved in at the top of an absolutely beautiful old building in my hometown of Oswestry. Street. It was the sort of place that people would say when you told them where you lived, ooh, that's fancy, ooh, that's posh. It was that sort of a building, and it was very expensive for what it was. It was costing me £450 a month for a one-bedroom flat, but my goodness me, it was absolutely beautiful and a really peaceful, lovely place to live. At the top of the building, right in the very roof of the building, with a balcony from the living room that overlooked the rooftops of Oswestry and then out into the countryside in the distance. And you could see from different landmarks where the canal had its route around through the countryside. And it was just an absolutely beautiful place. I've got absolutely nothing to fault it with, other than the fact it was expensive compared to boat life. And it made my life so much easier because Instead of having these massive commutes to get to and from work, I literally just had to walk for 10 minutes, not even that in fact. And equally, my friends and family are in the vast majority in the Oswestry area, so of course I found myself not having to cycle and have these massive awkward commutes to go and see them. And I thought really in the early period of land life, even though I had no real plans or any idea what I was doing, to be honest. But yeah, this is it. I'm made now. I'm sorted for life. This is absolutely spot on. Nice, easy life. And I was still going out and about doing all of my biking and walking. I admittedly did ignore the bike and the bike sort of fell away. And it was just such a great place, the location in town to be able to go out into the low hills walking and all the different footpaths around going into the countryside that I just found myself doing that all the time and going off wondering and it was it was absolutely wonderful and admittedly I must tell you now and confess that I am also a massive nerd and because I had been on the boat for so long and I hadn't really had any proper sort of power sources and stuff on board I decided to get myself an absolutely crazy, powerful gaming laptop. And so I set that up in the flat and it was all very good. And I got a load of grief on uh, YouTube in the comments because I think people just, I don't know, people seemed very betrayed by the fact that I'd moved to land life. So then when I started talking about gaming as well, my goodness me, that was the end of the world. But truth be told, I could never get into gaming again in the way that I had done before boat life. I think that the balance of the great outdoors and technology in my life can be seen from this video that I made as just a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek response to some of the people who were giving me grief. And this was only about three months into living on dry land. And already I think it shows that I was still out and about. Hey Dan, I've heard that since you sold your boat, you just sit at home playing World of Warcraft all day and hate the outdoors. Yeah, well, about that.
in hindsight, I think that that video does a really great job of summing up my general land life experience over the two years, as I did just carry on living in the same way that I'd done for years before I even had Narrowboat Tilly. And I think the only difficulty and the only thing that brought my land life to an end was probably boredom. And over the last six months or so of my life on dry land, when I look back, that boredom was clear to see. I was constantly fiddling around with crazy lighting setups and moving the furniture around in the flat and just doing anything really to fill up my time and every spare moment that I had. And that was really summed up perfectly, I think, when I started to build a model railway layout. And I in fact dedicated what was my bedroom to just the model railway and moved all of my furniture into the living room, which is a testament to how huge the living room itself was. Ludicrously sized for me being there on my own. And until building the layout and moving my furniture to the living room, it was largely a completely empty room for most of the time that I lived there. Which, again, I suppose sums up why it was so wasteful to spend £450 a month living there when I could have got a two-bedroom semi-detached house for less than that per month. But really, I think that something that sums up how confused or how much of a lack of direction I had at this point of my life is this video that I recorded at the start of 2018. At the time of recording this, I hadn't looked at a boat, I hadn't really got a clue that by the end of the year, yet alone within a few months, I would be back living on a boat. Well, my friends, I've got to be completely honest with you and say that recently I've actually been feeling bored, which is a feeling that I'm just not used to. I don't know if it's just the general sort of routine of land life sort of now getting thin and the novelty's worn off of being able to have this easy peasy life again like before Tilly and all of the crazy levels of biking and running around through the countryside through all sorts of weather conditions and all that or whether it's something different that I need a completely different sort of total change of well I don't know really what it's just a general sort of having another Christmas on dry land and going through all the usual routines of the oh here comes the winter, oh it's easy because I only have to walk about 10 minutes to work whereas there is all the fun and games of, well I know it was a terrible terrible winter the last one I had on board Tilly with all the endless rain and record breaking flooding and all that, make no mistake that wasn't a fun enjoyable experience but what I've got now I feel is just too easy, too simple. There's no thought as to go into anything, I suppose. And last year I wrote and caught up and finished off writing a lot of the little book ideas that I'd had that had been endlessly put off and I delayed and delayed until last year I did, I don't know, was it released about five of my short books or something like that, including the paperback collection? But it was stuff like that. It, just having nothing really to worry about. I could actually sit down and do all that and be that productive. But it's a level of productivity and a level of writing and stuff that I can't do year after year. So I think I found myself at the start of this year wanting to just take a big break like I've done for the last few months. And then really being in this position now where I've had time to be away from YouTube, be away from all of the people saying, buy another boat, buy another boat which has ironically probably given me a chance to look around, take stock of life, think about the future and not have any influences on me for the last two months or so. And then be like, you know what, perhaps they're right, buy another boat. Oh, look, how it's not just me birthmark, it's me bright pink face today. <laughs> when I first viewed Narrowboat Abel's Ark, I had actually been intending on that particular day to buy an entirely different boat. A boat that was ironically called Tilly Mint. It was almost as if the universe was willing me back to the canals as it was doing so right down to the detail of giving me another boat called Tilly to live on. However, when me and my granddad rolled up to the marina and saw Tilly Mint, there was a horrible moment in which my heart absolutely sank. 
and there was a sign on top of here that no longer said for sale, but instead said under offer. And in that moment, I can't tell you how I felt. I was so disappointed. And I literally said to my granddad, oh, let's just go. I I don't don't want to be here. I don't want to look at these other boats. But because it was my granddad's first trip out to come and view some of these boats with me, because I'd already been looking at different boats myself, he was like, oh, are you sure? Are you sure? Oh, let's just go and have a look and just see what else is around. And when we went in the marina office, I said, oh, I was actually coming out to uh, put an offer in on Tilly Mint. So just let me know if anything happens and it falls through. And they said, well, actually, as chance would have it, there's a boat that's coming back up onto the market tomorrow that's 45 foot long, similar price range, called Abel's Ark. Would you like to go and have a look at it now? And so I said, oh yeah, definitely, let's have a look. But my heart really wasn't in it because moments earlier, I just had the disappointment of my life with the boat that I was intending to make my home potentially for the next decade being snatched away right at the moment that I was intending to buy it. And I really was intending to pay as much as was needed to get that boat. But I went up and me and my granddad were shown around Abel's Ark. And even though the boat was absolutely fine, there was no real fault with it. I just wasn't in the mindset and I just wanted to go home and just sulk really and... Again, it's that silly thing that in the moment and wrapped up in the emotions and that of the disappointment, I just couldn't couldn't look at the boat for what it was. So I went back home and a few days passed and I thought, you know what, let's go back and have a look at Abel's Ark properly with a clear mind, without all of the nonsense of Tilly Mint stuck in my mind, blinding my vision. And I'd looked at other boats that were local and some that were a bit further afield than perhaps I would have wanted my maiden voyage on a boat to have been. But ultimately I found myself going out for a second look at Abel's Ark and really liking what I saw. I still couldn't quite bring myself to make an offer on that particular day though. But I went home and I started doing some maths and I started having to think about things properly. And I phoned the marina up and I made an offer of 26000 against the asking price of 30000 And I was very surprised when I got a phone call with a counter offer back that was only 26500 I thought, flipping heck, for the sake of 500 quid, that's, that's barely a counter offer on a sum of 26000 But I thought, you know what, no, 26 is the maximum that I want to pay for this boat without having a survey or without having it out of the water beforehand. So I declined the offer, but I was expecting, in all honesty, to receive a phone call maybe 20 minutes later saying, OK, then you can have it for 26,000. And that phone call never came. And in the ebbs and flows of life, It just so happens that that evening I was going out to my dad's house just over into Wales in a lovely rural little village to spend a week there while he was away on holiday himself. So it was just a nice change of scenery with all of a different section of countryside to go and cycle and walk through. And it was a chance for me to just get away from boat hunting and stop looking at boats every second of every day that I had spare and just really relax and clear my mind. And anyway, I came back and life carried on as normal and I still didn't have a boat. And then a strange thing happened. Abel's Ark was reduced in price to 25,000. And it was at that point that I started to think, well, you know what, we can do business now. And despite the fact that I'd already offered more than the new asking price for Abel's Ark, I thought, you know what, let's try something a bit cheeky here. Let's try and get a proper bargain. So I made an offer of £22,000 on the boat, which was an unconditional offer saying I, I don't want it out of the water first. Well, I did want it out of the water first, but I was prepared to pay 22000 without it coming out of the water for an inspection. I knew I was on to a winner when I got a phone call from the marina and the first question I was asked was, How quickly could I pay that money? 
And when my answer was literally tomorrow, if you won it, I was told that I had just bought a boat. On Friday the 27th of April 2018, I officially became a boater once again and took the keys of narrowboat Abel's Ark. I was probably happier on that day than I'd been for a very long time, maybe even happier than when I'd first taken the keys for narrowboat Tilly. Not because narrowboat Tilly was an inferior boat and not because my time on board Narrowboat Tilly means less than my time on board Abel's Ark, but because Abel's Ark represents to me not only a return to the canal lifestyle, but also a return with a bit of a refinement, a more grown up and sensible approach to canal life, and accepting that there's things that I need to do, such as learn to drive that will make my life far easier and far more likely to work out well in terms of a long-term prospect of living on board Abel's Ark for maybe a decade, maybe even longer into the future. And that's something that gives me a great deal of motivation and excitement. And I really cannot wait to see how the next few months and years unfold and whether those years become a decade or longer or whether I find myself upgrading to an even bigger boat and having maybe somebody else join me on board too. Who knows what the future holds but my goodness me I really can't wait to find out. See the call of the canal to me wasn't a call of some sort of idealism of this simple rustic lifestyle and trying to live as if I was 80 years in the past or anything high-minded like that. The call of the canal was to me simply the call to be happy and to do stuff that makes me happy as often as I can for as long as I can whenever and wherever I can and ultimately just as I thought many many years ago when I first had the spark of an idea that I might be able to live on a narrowboat. I found myself in recent times drawn back and having those same thoughts. I like walking, I like cycling, I like astronomy, I like peaceful environments that I can sit down and write my books in. My goodness me, a narrowboat sounds absolutely ideal. Well, let's give it a go for a second time around.